In section 2.4, we're going to look at continuity and one-sided limits. Informally, we say that f is continuous at x equals to c means that there is no interruption in the graph of f at x equals to c. So one of the, the intuitive ways that you can kind of think about is that, first of all, function is, is, of being continuous, it's a property of a function at a point. If you can draw the, the function's graph without having to lift your pencil off of the, the paper, then the graph is going to be continuous for those values of x. Okay? However, there's some situations where a function will not be continuous. For example, if the function is not defined at the point c, so if f of c does not exist, then the function will not be continuous there. If we try to draw this graph, we would have to momentarily lift our pencil up to incorporate that open circle there because the function lacks a value um, at c. Okay. Another reason why a function may not be continuous at x equals to c is if we get a different left hand and right hand limit. Okay. Just going to scale the y axis. As we approach c coming in from the left hand side, we see that the function values are increasing. It's going up and up and up. And from the left hand side, the function values are approaching 2. On the other side, if we approach c coming in from the right hand side, here the function values are going down and down and down, and they'd be approaching the value 1. So when the left hand behavior at c of f and the right hand behavior at c at, uh, of c are different, then we say that the function is not continuous at that value x equals to c. We'll come up with a term for this in a little bit. This is what's called a jump discontinuity. And we can classify it more thoroughly when we start to talk about one-sided limits. The third thing that can happen is maybe we actually do have a limit. Again, I'll just kind of put some numbers on the scale here. So if you look at what's happening, whether you approach c from the left or c from the right, the function values are approaching the value 2. So here the limit is 2. But at x equals to c, for whatever reason, the function was defined to be equal to 1. And so what happens is we do have a hole here in the graph, and the point where the function is defined at c is somewhere else other than where it would probably naturally uh, want, want it to go. So here's an example where we have a limit. We have a function value at the point, but those two values are different. That will also prevent a function from being continuous. So the proper definition of continuity at a point, we see that f is continuous at x equals to 3 when the following situation holds. When the limit as x approaches to c of f of x is equal to, to f of c. So this is the definition for a function to be continuous at the value x equals to c. And a lot of times what we can do is we can kind of break this definition down into three pieces. It really means three things. Um, the first thing it would mean is that, and this is a typo, this should be f of c. So first thing is that f of c is defined, meaning the function does have a value when x equals to c. The second thing is that the limit as x approaches to c of f of x exists. And then the third thing is that we would require that the value of the limit to be equal to the value of the function at that point. Okay. So this is the definition of continuity at a point. We can extend this and say that a function is continuous on an open interval a to b whenever it is continuous at each point within the interval. If a function is continuous for all real numbers, then we say that the function is just continuous everywhere. One of the things that's especially nice about functions that are continuous at a point, and something we saw kind of in the, the last bit of sections, is that if f is continuous, at the point x equals to c, then that gives us a way to find the limit. That's precisely the types of functions we can find the limit via direct substitution. We say that if a function is not continuous at a point c, then we refer to it as being discontinuous, or the function has a discontinuity at x equals to c. We can classify the discontinuities in two different types. There's what's called a removable discontinuity, 
and a removable discontinuity exists whenever the limit as x approaches to c of f of x exists. For example, the discontinuities in A and C would both be what we call removable discontinuities. Okay. The reason why this in graph in A and the graph in C has a removable discontinuity is because we do have a limit as x approaches the C of f of x. The way that the discontinuity can be removed is by simply defining the value at C. So here we don't have a value for f of x at C. What you would do is just simply define f of c to be whatever the limit is. That would kind of fill in that point, and that would remove the, the discontinuity, make it, the graph nice and, and complete. So when you have a limit at x equals to c, the discontinuity can be removed. Similarly over here, we have a limit that exists, so let's call this limit... L, so as x approaches c from the left or from the right, the function values are approaching this y value of, we'll call it L, which is our limit, but for whatever reason, the value of f of c is different from L. The way that the discontinuity can be removed this time is by simply redefining the value of f at c. So I'll call this, I don't know, maybe um, M. So let's redefine Instead of having f of c be equal to m, if we define f of c to be equal to l, then that would move that point back to where we would kind of want it to be in the first place, and that would make the function nice and continuous on the interval a to b. Okay. There are other types of discontinuities, and these are called non-removable discontinuities. So a non-removable discontinuity occurs when the limit as x approaches to c of f of x does not exist. So if we don't have a limit at x equals to c, then the discontinuity is going to be non-removable. A couple examples of non-removable discontinuities would be the one like this. The limit as we approach c from the left is some number. The limit as we approach c from the right is a different value, and therefore the limit as x approaches to c does not exist. This is what's called a jump discontinuity, and it's a non-removable type. Other types of non-removable discontinuities would be if you had like a vertical asymptote at x equals to c, the limit would not exist there either. Or if you look at the graph of something like, let's say, uh, sine of 1 over x, where if you had like one of those um, oscillating discontinuities, at x equals to 0, this function would have a non-removable discontinuity, again, because the limit does not exist. In example one, we're asked to discuss the continuity of each function. Let's take a look at example one. For us, our classic kind of functions, the ones that we're familiar with, the algebraic functions, uh, the transcendental functions, the trigonometric functions, they will be continuous at all values of x that are in the domain of the functions. So if we look at this function here, to kind of determine where it's continuous, it's almost equivalent to asking the question of, well, what is the domain of the function? Here we have a rational function. We know that we cannot divide by 0. So x cannot be equal to 0. So the function will be continuous. for all x, x different from 0. Typically speaking, we would want to write this in interval notation. That's the proper way to write a, a set. So it's everything from negative infinity up to but not including 0, and then everything from 0 on to positive infinity. So these would be the values for which f of x is continuous. If we're curious, if we wanted to be a little bit deeper uh, in terms of what we're saying here, if you look at the limit of x approaching to 0 of f of x, remember this is our basic um, reciprocal graph. We should know what it looks like. But essentially what's happening is when x equals to 0, we have a vertical asymptote. So this limit does not exist. And what the function have, S ha f has a non-removable discontinuity.
at x equals to 0. Let's do another one of these. In example 1, part b, we want to discuss the continuity of g of x equals x squared minus 1 divided by x minus 1. Again, it's another rational function. This function will be defined as long as the denominator is not equal to 0, and that occurs when x equals 2 to 1. So g of x is continuous. For all x different from 1, that would be the set negative infinity to 1, union 1 to infinity. It's the entire real line with just the point 1 removed. If we want to determine the type of discontinuity we have at x equals to 1, in terms of labeling it either removable or non-removable, what we would need to do would be to investigate the limit as x approaches to 1 of g of x. This is the limit as x approaches to 1 of x squared minus 1 divided by x minus 1. If you tried to find this limit via direct substitution, you would get 0 over 0, which is our indeterminate form. Thankfully for us, we can actually go ahead and factor and cancel this. The numerator is a difference of squares. The x minus 1 would cancel, and so we have the limit as x approaches to 1 of x plus 1, which should be 1 plus 1, which is 2. So this function actually does have a limit as x approaches to 1, so we could say that g has a removable discontinuity. at, and I'll spell it out, a removal discontinuity at x equals to 1. If you're curious to what the graph would look like, so here's x equals to 1, here's 2, the graph of this function would look like this. we have a hole when x equals to 1. If somebody wanted to remove the discontinuity, remember g is undefined at 1, if we were to simply define the value for g of 1 to be equal to 2, then that would fill that point in and make the, the function continuous. But irregardless, f has a removable discontinuity at x equals to 1. Let's take a look at h of x. This is a piecewise defined function, and these things are classic um, examples to help illustrate the concept of continuity. The first thing we want to make note of is that the pieces that make up the function h of x, first of all, x plus 1, that's going to be continuous for all real numbers because it's a polynomial. Right? Polynomials are very well-behaved functions, so in particular, this piece will be continuous on this portion of the domain, which is x less than or equal to 0. Similarly, e to the x is also going to be continuous everywhere because it's a nice um, exponential function. So in particular, it will be continuous on the interval x greater than 0. The only thing that's really left to kind of investigate here is whether or not h of x will also be continuous at kind of the point where the one piece stops and the other piece starts. Because conceivably, one of two things could happen when you kind of construct a piecewise function with continuous pieces. It's possible that maybe they kind of match up nicely, and wherever the one function, let's say, stops, the other function might pick up exactly at the same point, and then your function would be continuous for all real numbers. However, it's also entirely possible that when you try to put two functions together, where the one function stops... The other one might start somewhere else, which can very easily create a uh, jump or non-removable discontinuity. So we know that it's, everything is fine with the exception of what's going to happen at x equals 2 to 0 here. Okay. 
We haven't gotten to the one-sided notation limit, but this is essentially what we're going to be looking at. Um, we want to evaluate, you know, is this function continuous at zero? So first of all, h of zero, if we plug zero in, when x is less than or equal to zero, it goes into this part here. This is going to be zero plus one, which is one. So that's the value of h of zero. If, at, if h is continuous at zero, then that would mean that the limit as x approaches to zero of h of x would be equal to h of zero, which is one. So now let's go ahead and evaluate the limit. And we'll see this here formally in a minute, but I'm actually going to jump right into the notation. If we want to approach zero, so think about the number line. If you want to approach zero, we can come in from two different approaches. We can approach it coming in from the, from the left-hand side, or we can approach it coming in from the, from the right-hand side. The notation for a left-hand approach, so this is from values that are kind of on the negative side of the, of the x-axis, or to the left of zero, so we use the subscript, x approaches zero from the left of h of x. If we're approaching zero from the left, so coming in from this direction over here, those are going to be values that are slightly less than zero. And if you're looking at the way h is constructed, for values that are slightly less than zero, we're using the piece x plus one. So this would be the limit as x approaches to zero from the left of x plus one, and that limit can be found via direct substitution. Just plug in 0 for x, and we get a limit of 1. If we look at the limit as x approaches 0 from the right of h of x, coming into 0 from the right, these would be values that are slightly greater than 0, so we're coming in from this direction. And if x is greater than 0, then we would be using this piece of the function. So this is the limit as x approaches to 0 from the right of e to the x. That limit can be found via direct substitution. That's e to the 0, which is 1. So what this tells us, and this is going to be the, the definition we'll have here in a moment. When we say this um, expression, when we say the limit as x approaches to 0 of h of x exists, what that means is that the left-hand limit exists and the right-hand limit exists, and furthermore, those two values would have to be the same. So this tells us that the limit as x approaches to zero in general of h of x, meaning both left side and right side exist and are equal to, to one. Okay. Well, the limit is one, the value at zero is one, and that's precisely what it means for h to be continuous at x equals to zero. So in summary, x is continuous for all less than x less than or equal to zero, it's continuous for x greater than zero, and it's also continuous at x equals to zero, therefore h of x is continuous everywhere. So it's continuous on negative infinity to infinity. The, the one-sided notation and limits will come to that in a moment, but if you're curious as to what this graph would look like, um, it looks like the following. For x is less than or equal to 0, the graph looks like this portion of a straight line with a y-intercept of 1 and a slope of 1. And then after x is greater than 0, what it looks like would be a graph of like e to the x, so it looks like this. And wherever the line stops is precisely where the exponential picks up. So we don't have any breaks, no gaps in the graph. You can draw this thing without lifting your, your pen or pencil off the paper. And that's why this graph is continuous for all real numbers. In part D, we want to look at y equals the sine of x. One of the things we recall from trigonometry is that the domain of the sine function is all real numbers. And because the sine is a well-behaved function, therefore it's also going to be continuous on its domain. So this function is continuous for all real numbers. 
If you remember the graph of the sine of x from trigonometry, it's a graph that oscillates infinitely often between negative 1 and positive 1. It's a periodic function, but certainly you can graph that function without lifting your pencil or paper off the, the page. So intuitively, it is the graph of a continuous function.